Okay. I got the recording going, <clears throat> so uh, I'm going to get started. That's okay. okay. So, yeah. what, what's uh, what's the um, the title of your your holiday? Is it Independence Day or like a Liberation Day? No, it's just Thanksgiving. Thank, just Thanksgiving. Okay, so it's that's that. yeah. Very good. Happy Thanksgiving before we start. Thank you. So, so um, anyway, this is the, the third part of a three part series. And uh, this is going to be on power development uh, for the rotational shots put specifically. Obviously, a lot of these principles you can use for uh, other areas of training as well. And, um, but I'm going to give kind of specific examples a power training here for shot put and specifically for rotational shot putting. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the training methods that uh, some of the top shot putters that we've talked about already these last couple parts. Um, you know, I'll include these in here, here and there. And then uh, when we finish up, we'll finish up a little bit before one o'clock. We can kind of have a wrap up question and answer okay. session. And uh, what I was going to do is I have the recordings from the first two parts and the PowerPoints as well. I was going to put them all in a Dropbox file all at once and do that either right when we finish up or maybe this evening, actually, because I, I have to download the recording. It takes a little while and I have to run out to practice after our meeting here. So I'll probably get the recording finished in the afternoon and then send it out. So uh, you guys will, will have that. To, you could kind of download that and then have that for your own personal files so to draw from okay so so anyway just to to kick off here uh, i kind of want to talk a little bit um a little bit of theory first and then we're going to kind of get into specific examples and show some videos of exercises and talk about different things but i want to talk a little bit about just the basic theory of um of strength training and uh without getting too technical i'll try to make this as very general as possible. If you look at this table right here, uh, or this graph, uh, you'll see along the x-axis we have time, and that's a millisecond, so it's a very short period of time. And then you look at force on the y-axis. The ability to generate power is the ability to generate a lot of force over a short period of time. So if you have a certain amount of force and you generate that force over a shorter period of time, that's becoming more powerful or over a given period of time, if you can generate more force during that short sliver of time, you're becoming more powerful. So this is what we're trying to do with our power training for, uh, for shot put and for track and field in general for the power events. And uh, as we're trying to get, uh, to be able to generate more force over a shorter period of time. So if you look at the blue line there, that's basically what we call a force velocity curve for an untrained person. So basically, over a, uh, a certain given period of time, they'll be able to produce a certain amount of force. This is kind of what it looks like is, initially the first movement they do when they do an activity, they'll generate almost all the force that they can in the first you know, 0.15 seconds, and then it'll gradually taper, or it'll taper off pretty fast after that. So when you in, start looking at doing heavy resistance training, um, and this is, you know, heavy weightlifting where you're lifting for max, which is the most common form of weightlifting. Uh, usually when you see people put, uh, you know, pictures up or videos up on YouTube or something like that, they're showing that people doing their max. So that's heavy resistance training. When you do that type of training, you'll alter that force velocity curve uh, in a certain way. And what that is, is if you look at the, the black uh, line now, that's the heavy resistance training curve. If you take an untrained individual and you train them for a couple months and just do heavy resistance training, so you're lifting lots of weight, not that many reps, just trying to lift as heavy a weight as you can. What you're going to see is you're not really going to change how quickly they can apply force. What you're going to change is how much maximally they can apply force. So in the first 0.5 to 0.3 seconds, the, that force velocity curve actually won't change very much. So, but then what you'll see is after a little bit longer, they'll be able to produce a lot more force. So what you're gonna see is if you have like a heavy object, 
let's say you're helping somebody move a house and you got to move a piano, a person that's very uh, well weight trained and heavy resistance, they'll be able to pick up that piano. And at first it's not going to move that much, but then after a while, they'll be able to move like a 500 pound piano and pick it up. That's what you get for heavy resistance training. The initial movement though, really is not going to be that much different than an untrained individual. Now, conversely, if you look at that red line there and you see that, that red arc, you see explosive strength training. This is lightweight training. Uh, this is medicine ball throwing, ball throwing, uh, jumping, bounding, things like that. For explosive strength training, if you do that for a couple months, you'll see a very different change in the curve. And what you'll see is initially that explosive movement, or that, that person will be much more explosive and generate a lot more force right away. So when they're doing something like a vertical jump where you got to move very quickly right away, that explosive strength training is gonna have that person improve their vertical leap quite a bit. What you'll see though, unlike the heavy resistance training is as time goes on, they don't develop quite as much, um, they can't develop quite as much for a pure force after a longer period of time than a heavy uh, resistance trained person. So. You want to kind of understand basically how these two types of training affect what you're doing. When you're looking at shot putting, you could say, hey, you know, shot putting, it's the heaviest of all events. It's a lot heavier than javelin. It's a lot heavier than discus. So we need to do lots of heavy resistance training. But at the same time, think about how much a shot put weighs compared to what you lift in the weight room. And it's really a pretty light weight. So shot putting is actually a very, very light form of uh, weight training. So what you're gonna to wanna to do ultimately when you're setting up your strength training programs is set up a combination of heavy resistance training and explosive strength training. Don't settle for one over the other. You wanna have a combination of both. Um, I would say in events like the discus and javelin, you're gonna err on doing more explosive strength training and less heavy resistance training. But of the four throwing disciplines, shot put, you're gonna have heavy resistance training will probably uh, make up half your your weight training regime. The other half of your weight training regime is probably going to be explosive strength training, most likely. So having said that, I want to move on here and just take a look at the requirements of what we're trying to do when we're doing the throwing events. And what we're doing here, I got four pictures here, one for each of the four different disciplines. Just remember what you're trying to do with each one of these disciplines, because they're all a little bit different. With the shot put, you have the heaviest implement, which is, you know, 7.26 kilograms for the men, four kilograms for the women. And uh, what you're going to see is, is the uh, final release speed. If you look at that lower uh, picture in the lower right hand corner of Thomas Majewski, the top release speeds you're going to generate are about 13 to 14 meters per second. That's for the most elite shot putters. And something like the Javelin, uh, which is a lot lighter implement, the top release speeds are gonna be somewhere between 26 to 30 meters per second. So basically twice as fast as the shot. For the hammer throw, the release speeds are gonna be at the elite levels will be very close to what you see in the javelin, probably 27 to 28 meters per second. And then for the discus, you see the bigger picture here with Rooker Smith, who's a fine shot put and discus thrower, um, throwing the, the discus, the top throwers throw about 23 to 25 meters per second upon release. So for shot put, you're probably going to be throwing a little bit heavier implement, but still you're going to be moving it very, very fast. So 13 to 14 meters per second is still pretty fast. Obviously it's, it's probably about faster than you can really run. Um, and it's going to be faster. You can move any type of weights in the weight room, especially when you're trying to hold on to those weights. So you want to, when you're trying to generate, um, you know, or produce uh, power for power generation, when you're throwing it, you're going to need to look beyond weight training and be doing things where you're moving a weight 10, 12 meters per second in some cases, not just one and two meters per second like you see with heavy weight training. So when you're looking at different exercises, uh, I'm gonna break down the different categories of exercises that you're gonna wanna use. And, and, and lots of people break them up in different ways here. This just happens to be how I categorize them. So you have event specific exercises. So for the shot put, this would be like throwing heavy or light shots. Um, rate of force development exercises, which are very explosive exercises that are pretty similar to what you're going to be doing in a throwing event. These are something like medicine ball throws, for example, or multi throws. The third category here, we have absolute strength exercises. This is heavy weight training. 
And so when you're when I, we're talking about absolute strength, we're t- you're talking about the absolute largest amount of weight that you can lift. And when you're lifting the largest amount of weight you can lift, you're barely moving it at all. It's almost coming to a stop. So this would be very heavy weight training, like squats, bench, clean, snatch. Then we have speed and agility exercises. This is basically running, jumping, hurdle mobility, those type of things. And uh, then also plyometric and jumping exercises. So this is a wide variety of uh, jumps, stair jumps, hurdle jumps, box jumps, uh, and those type of things. Even some, uh, some jumps in place with weight could kind of fall under um, this category too. So usually your uh, training regime, in addition to throwing, is going to be made up of exercises from these five broad categories. Now, there's a few things you want to look at when you're setting up a uh, power program for your athlete. And probably the number one thing is you want to look at variation between individuals. So I have a picture here of Christian Cantwell. This is when he won the world championship back in 2009 um, in the shot put. And Christian was a guy that was obviously really big and strong, and he liked to lift a lot of weight. He didn't do a whole lot of running and jumping. He did a lot of lifting. And uh, when he threw stuff, he threw the heavy stuff really well. He didn't throw the light stuff very well. So there were certain things that he liked to do and they did well. And there's other things that he didn't like to do as much and didn't do quite as well. And so when you're looking at training your athletes, you kind of have to make the decision about, um, you know, what their various strengths and weaknesses are and uh, how you're going to deal with those things. The other thing that you want to do too, is take a look at psychological factors and look at your athletes and go, you know, um, if I have them work on their weaknesses, are they going to be able to handle um, working on those weaknesses? Are they going to get depressed and just want to work on just their, their strengths? And so you have to kind of uh, look at that and see if the athletes um, want to be well-rounded or if they want to be very much just good at what they do and that's it. Uh, I think ideally in the long run, it's good to have a well-rounded athlete that, that's both fast and strong and flexible and and scores well in each uh, in individual category. However, depending on the type of time you have to train your athlete and uh, in, in what their mentality is and what they're good at and not good at, you have to kind of figure out whether you can actually pull that off. So point number three on the bottom there, if you look at this slide, look at the situation and you can decide whether you wanna address the weaknesses or the strengths or work on a little bit of both. So I wanna give you an example and this is actually a real life example of uh, strengths and weaknesses in terms of throwing shots a different weight. And uh, if you look at this table right here, these are actually meet results from a meet that was uh, conducted in Poland back in 2011, is at the very end of the season after the world championships. And it's pretty interesting what they did in this meet is they brought the three best shot putters on the men's side together. It was Dylan Armstrong from Canada, Christian Cantwell from the US and Tomasz Majewski from Poland. And what they did is they gave the athletes in this competition, normally they'd th- get the um, 7.26 kilogram shot and they would throw it you know, for six attempts Then whoever had the farthest attempt would win. Well, what they did, they did a little something different here. And what they did is they gave everybody two attempts to throw a different weighted shot. So they started off throwing the eight kilogram shot and everybody got two attempts. Then they went to the 7.26 kilogram shot. Everybody got two attempts and then the six kilogram, and then the five kilogram. So what you see there is when you look at the eight kilogram when they started, Christian Cantwell, who overall was the top rated thrower coming in, he won the competition and threw about 20 meters 20. Uh, Dylan Armstrong was second, right about 20 meters. And Majewski was third, throwing about like, uh, you know, 1960, 1970, something like that. Now, when they went to the 7.26, what you can see there, was the result stayed about the same. Obviously the athletes threw further, but the placing stayed about the same with Christian winning again at just over 2140. And then uh, Dylan Armstrong actually slid up and was right behind him at like 2135. And then Majewski was still third at like about 21 meters even. And so <clears throat> right there with a the heavy implement, Christian Cant- Cantwell was definitely the best. Now what was interesting is when they went to the six kilogram, which is a lot lighter, then all of a sudden you notice Christian Cantwell, who had won the first two competitions, he dropped down and easily the third worst or, or the third best. He was the, the shortest throwing thrower with a six kilogram. Um, Dylan Armstrong 
took the lead and threw about uh, just about 23 meters even with that 6K. And Majewski was virtually tied with him there at about uh, 23 meters as well with the 6K. <clears throat> then when they went to the 5K, Majewski really took a dominant lead and threw about 25 meters. And I want to say, I believe Majewski won the overall competition because how they did the competition was they added up the best mark for each weight and then gave him a total score of like, you know, 96 meters, 0.57 centimeters or something like that. So Majewski was easily the best of the 5K. Dylan was in between um, just about 24 meters. And what's interesting with Christian is notice how Christian, his six and his 5K almost didn't improve. It was the same. So he was such a heavily um, weight trained and a guy used to training so much with the heavy shot he really couldn't feel anything below the 6K. If you he, if he gave him a 4K, he'd probably throw the 4K um, the same as the 5K. So, but he was able to win at the regular distance or for the, the regular shot at 7.26. So, you know, for a guy like Christian, you could ask yourself, what would make him a better shot putter at 7.26 meters? Should we try to get his eight kilogram better or should we try to get his light stuff better? Which one will make him a better thrower? I would argue and say that his, 8K throw, uh, if you improve that, that would probably help a 7.26 kilogram shot the most. I'll tell you one other funny little story along these lines. It, it involves Christian again, throwing heavy implements is, we were um, getting ready for the Olympics in 2012 in London. And I was coaching Reese at the time. And Reese is in really good shape. He's throwing about 2180 in practice, um, pretty comfortably, 2160 to 2180. And Christian came over and started throwing with, uh, with Reese. And uh, Ryan Whiting was also on the team. So we, all three of us were throwing with all the coaches and trainers watching. But Christian was throwing a 17-pound shot. So that's like 7.7 .7 kilograms. And Christian comes over. He throws 2170, 2180 as well with a 17-pound shot. So he's got a heavier shot than regulation. And he's beating everybody else. And both Reese and Ryan and myself and Ryan's coach knew that Christian actually threw the 17 pound shot further than he throws the 16. His best shots actually the 17 pound shot, not the 16. So we were like, well, in the meet, he'll throw 2130. So Reese is throwing better than him. But everybody else is going, Christian's going to win the gold medal. Look at this. He's throwing, he's going to throw 22 and a half meters in competition because he can throw the 17 as far as he does. They didn't realize he throws the 17 further than the 16. And that's why Christian was throwing the 17 because it gave him it made him feel good that he could out throw everybody else with it. So it was kind of funny that the, the light shot feeling, Christian got a light shot feeling by throwing a heavy shot. So this just kind of plays to the psychological aspect of doing a heavier light, um, you know, throwing of implements. So I, I'll give you this table right here. Um, this is a conversion table. This, this is one for the men, for example. And if you look at the center column right here, I'll kind of take my cursor and show you the center column. This distance right here would be the distance. If you throw the 7.26 kilogram shot this distance, what I've done is mathematically figured out the proportions for how far an equivalent throw would be with either a heavy or a light shot. So for example, right here, if you can throw 17 meters with the 7.26, then with the eight kilogram shot, you should probably be able to throw about 16 meters with the eight kilogram. Conversely, if you're a 17 meter thrower with a 7.26, and we slide over and look at the, um, the, the six kilogram shot, you should be able to throw almost 19 meters with a six kilogram shot. That would be a straight conversion there. And then these tables are good to have in case you're throwing lighter, heavy shots, and you can see how well your athletes are doing um, you know, if, you know, in comparison to if they're throwing the regulation shot. And of course, you probably would want to throw the heavy shots to work on a little bit of specific strength. However, on the other hand, you have to watch it a little bit when you throw too much heavy shot because your athletes might change their technique a little bit just to make sure they get more distance with the heavy shot. Then when they slide back over and throw the regulation shot, they might have changed their technique a little bit. So you have to pay a little bit of attention and, and make sure the technique is staying steady that way. Uh, same is true for the light implements as well. You want to make sure that you don't alter your technique too much just to get more distance. Um, what I personally have used the light shots for is, is when my athletes are a little bit tired. Uh, if we're a little bit tired, instead of throwing the 7.26 kilogram, we'll throw like the seven kilogram. 
or maybe the 6.8 kilogram shot. If we're really, really tired, I mean, really beat down from the weights or coming back from illness or something like that, then we'll maybe throw something a little bit lighter, like a 6K or a 6.36 kilogram shot, uh, just because it'll, uh, it'll be more like the timing, if you were fresh, that you would have with the 7.26. I'll give you another real life example of throwing light shots with Reese Hoffa, for example. When he comes back from like a two or three week stay in Europe competing professionally, he'll come back to the US for two or three weeks to come back and train uh, before he goes back over and does another set of competitions. When he comes back from Europe, he's usually pretty tired and exhausted. So we'll usually start our first sessions again with a 6.5 kilogram shot. And he could throw that about 21 meters. And then after about a week, when he starts to feel a little bit better and he's, he's got some home cooking and getting back his sleep patterns, then we'll increase and throw a 6.8 or maybe a seven kilogram shot. Then the next week after that, when he's about fully recovered from that long trip to, to uh, Europe, then we'll throw the 7.26 kilogram again. Hopefully they're again throwing 21 meters. So we use the weight of the shot and chop some weight off the weight of the shot to compensate for the fatigue that we feel. So the shot's always kind of feeling the same way for the most part, if possible. Now, I wanna talk a little bit about when you're setting up training, I wanna talk a little bit about this thing called a power index, which is actually pretty simple to calculate and you really only need two readings to calculate it. And the power index is basically, you generate it by taking the square root of your um, weight in pounds and multiply it by the square root of your vertical uh, jump in inches. So for example, um, we have, I have some of the top rotational throwers over on the left hand side here in the past 10 years, and you can see what their power indices were. And for the most part, a, a top 22 meter shot putter on the men's side, for example, is gonna have a power index of like uh, 95 or higher usually. So obviously uh, these throwers were well over 22. They weren't just right on 22, they were well over 22. And they all have power indices of, uh, of 95 or, or higher. Dylan Armstrong is, is off the chart, like at 112. I mean, that's just huge. Um, and you know he was, he was uh, 352 pounds, that's 160 kilograms with a vertical jump of about 90 centimeters to 36 inches. And that gives you this huge power index here. The, the next biggest power index, for example, on this chart here is Ryan Krauser, who obviously is the most dominant shot putter right now this year. He has a power of index of 105.6. And again, he's 310 pounds, which is basically 141 kilograms with a 36 inch vertical leap, just like Dylan Armstrong. I would say your average good 22 meter plus shot putter is usually around 95 to 98. That's what like Nelson, Godina and Hoffa were, for example. And you can see the numbers that we use to get, to get here to these things. Uh, you know, the, the, the lowest power index here is Tom Walsh at 92.46. And uh, that's mainly because of the lower vertical leap. Uh, you can see though with Tom, he kind of makes up for it with quickness and agility with his technique. So I think that's where he gets his extra power from is within his technique. Uh, on the women's side, you're probably going to see the top, top throwers. They're probably going to have power indices, I'd say, between like 82 and, uh, and maybe 88 something like that on the women's side uh, for, for the very top shot putters in the world right now. I'd say a good national level shot putter or like a 20 meter shot putter, for example, on the men's side, their power index is going to be, you know, probably about 90 or so, something like that, 90 or 91 is, is what I tend to say. Now, Adam Nelson was a unique example <clears throat> with when you, in, you know, throwing mostly about the throwing. Obviously you have to have some training, some supplemental training to get the massive power that you need to generate world-class throws, if that's what your goal is. Um, I want to tell you the story of Adam Nelson. Adam Nelson has the record for the longest time while throwing 22 meters. So he first threw 22 meters in 2000, 2000, the year of the Sydney Olympics. And then he also threw over 22 meters in 2011 you know, the year of the um, Daegu World Championships. And his power index back in 2000 was 98.78. It was, it was super, super high, it was basically at his highest. 
And when he threw 22 meters in 2011, his power index at that point had dropped to about 89. It dropped 10 points, but he's still able to throw 22 meters. So same guy, but different level of power. So he obviously had changed some things during the course of his career. And this is the other thing you want to take note of when you're coaching your athletes, especially if you have them for a long time is they may start out doing something really brilliant and throwing really far, doing things a certain way when they're young. But as they get older, they might start to change a little bit. They might not be quite as explosive or quite as fast or quite as flexible, yet they're still able to generate distance. And they might be generating distances with different rhythms, uh, different positions and those type of things. And also, uh, again, they might develop certain types of special type of strength that they didn't have before. Adam, as he got older, was a lot better at throwing heavy overweighted shots than he was when he was younger. So I think that partially explains a little bit why he was able to get this, uh, this, this, this distance at such an older age, you know, 11 years later, he wasn't quite as explosive with his vertical jump and with his jumping and sprinting as he was when he was younger. Most aren't, but I think with his special strength, he was a, a lot better. And so you need to kind of see these things and adapt these things with your athletes training as they go along. So let me show you right here with training, what you're gonna see in terms of the development with the power index, because the power, you know, a power index is something that you're gonna develop with training. It's not really something you're gonna be born with. I mean, to an extent, um, you'll, if you have a good power index, you'll, be, you'll get a lot of it just naturally, but it can be trained. You, know, you look at a top sprinter like Usain Bolt or something like that, He's very, very fast, but I don't think if he, if he never, ever trained at all, he wouldn't run 9.58, you know, uh, who knows, maybe he'd run 10.2 with absolutely no training, which is still faster than most, but you, you can train this. So I'm just giving you sort of a hypothetical example of what you're going to see with how the power index develops with an athlete over the course of three or four months. Okay. So let's say before we start training at all, we have your kind of generic general male shot putting athlete that weighs about uh, 264 pounds, that's 120 kilograms. And we test their vertical jump before we even do any type of training. And it's 24 inches, which is basically um, in, in um, metric would be um, 60 centimeters. And when you add those two uh, square root of those two numbers together, you're gonna get a power index of 79.4. And after one month of training, you do one month of hard training, and what you see is <clears throat> you're working, training hard, eating a lot, taking a lot of calories, and what you're going to see is that athlete's body weight is going to move up to 270 pounds, and their vertical jump stays the same. With all that training, you're adding weight when you're just doing a nice, basic, hard training phase, and hopefully you're not reducing the vertical jump. If you are keeping some sprints and jumps in there and, and you're throwing in the workout, they should be able to maintain their vertical jump while still adding on weight. And so after a month or six weeks, you, you check what their power index is again. And if you multiply these numbers out again, the power index turns into 80.35 because the vertical jump stay the same, but you added body weight. So the power index goes up by one. Then you go back and you do another four to six weeks of training, but now you're working on being more explosive and fast and quick with still some, some explosive weight training and some heavy weight training from time to time. And what you'll see is the athlete will, while doing all that work, will end up dropping some weight and they'll drop back down to 264. Their original weight when they had started basically about uh, eight to 12 weeks before. But now with this explosive training, their vertical jump will have moved up to 25 inches. So now their power index, when you add these two numbers here is 81.2. And then you repeat the process again, another four to six weeks later, you do heavy weight training again, vertical jump stays the same, body weight goes up, power index goes up. Then you repeat it one more time with more explosive training, body weight comes back down, vertical jump goes up yet again. And there you go, the power index just gradually climbs steadily throughout the course of the year. You can see if you do this for about you know, a whole year, the, the power index is going to go up by about a factor of three or four, maybe five in one season. And then after four seasons of hard training like that, maybe taking from when you're 18 to 22 years old, 
uh, your power index will go up 20 points and you're much, much more explosive than you were four years before. It's just a nice, steady, patient uh, regime. Here's a real life example of the power index progression for Reese Hoffa, okay? So if you look here on the far left side, this is the training year. Then the middle column is this personal best in the rotational shot that year. And then the far right column here is this power index, okay? There's a few NAs not available here. And basically the reason we have that there was we didn't test the vertical jump for whatever reason that year. So we couldn't really factor in the power index. What you'll notice here with the general trend is Reese's his throwing marks went up steadily all the way up to 2007 when he threw his all-time PR. <clears throat> and then you notice his power index just went steadily up. Okay, went up three points the first year, another two points the next year, another uh, three and a half points the next year. Then he started going about one point a year. And then he was up near his max. He's above 95 when he first broke 22. And then he pretty much stayed for the rest of his career up until about 1995 or 96 when he's finishing off his career. That's when his power index probably dropped back down to about 92 or 93. It stayed above 95. And you might say, coach, why, why, did, why did it stay at 95? How come he didn't try to get to 98 or something like that, like the other guys? We really felt at that point, <clears throat> Reese was executing very well. And, and the power index for him of 95 is really all we needed. We, we thought we had enough. We thought was what was gonna make or break him was competing well in competition, executing well, which he's very good at. During this time right here, he was ranked number one in the world four different times uh, in 2006, 2007, also 2012, and actually 2014, where we didn't take a vertical jump reading. He was number one in the world there too. If he wasn't number one or two, or number one, he was rated number two usually, number three in, in some very distant cases. So he was at a really high level here, but this is usually what you're gonna see in terms of power index achievement is, it's gonna take you probably about seven to 10 years to reach your max power rating. Okay, it's not something that's gonna come overnight. It'll gradually be built over time. So I know these are kind of some small numbers right here. Um, uh, again, you'll get a copy of this. So you can kind of look, uh, look over this. You could probably look at this for about 30 minutes and study it. It's basically Reese Hoffa's performance structure. And it basically tells you what his personal bests were for all different areas of training. Uh, we monitored a lot of different areas of training. Uh, you can see though, when he was younger and look at the first one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine categories here, we have a lot of different readings. And then when he got to be about number one in the world, right about that time, we really stopped uh, targeting and looking at these other readings here. We just focused on the throwing readings and a little bit of the weightlifting readings. And if you look at his weightlifting numbers, for the most part, his weightlifting numbers didn't really get much better after 2006. They just stayed level, okay? Because he had gotten to be where he's number one and we looked to see why he was number one. And when he threw his best, he could beat anybody. And we, so we wanted to make sure the main focus was being able to execute his best in the meets rather than let's just keep on getting bigger and stronger and bigger and stronger that we didn't feel that necessarily was going to ensure that he was going to be his best. We wanted to make sure that he was strong enough to be able to throw 22 and a half if possible, or at least low 22s back then is all it took to be number one. This day and age, it's a little bit different. It takes almost 23 now or so it seems to be number one. So, if Reese is still around today and was still fairly young, he, we'd have to kind of re-examine his training here. But the whole idea here is to kind of show you how we sort of approached his training. We developed him for about seven or eight years till he got to the, uh, an elite level, you know, 22 meters. And then we just maintained after that. Um, you can see his uh, vertical jump went up slowly up till about 2006 and then it stayed steady after that but his body weight kept on growing. Even after 2006, it kept on going up a little bit more and more, even though it was, but his vertical jump was staying the same. So when his body weight went up and the vertical jump stayed the same, he was still getting more explosive when his power index was going up. So we were happy with that. We were okay with that. So uh, you'll notice here, one thing that improved each year is you look at these numbers here, 
for the different weighted balls that he was throwing, they pretty much steadily grew each year. He got better and more skillful at throwing the different uh, weighted balls. And we felt that was his key to success, was just get better at throwing. You have all the supplementation and the power that you need to throw real far. Just make sure you get it out of yourself during competition. Now, these are, I'm just giving you some other examples of testing parameters. These are from Germany. Obviously, the Germans have a, a long and famous throwing lineage here. This is taken from one of their training books for throwing. Worf here is, is throw, or throws in German. And this is a track and field. And so this is for uh, shot putters. And so this is for uh, women, seven, this column here is women 17 and under. Women 19 and under, men 17 and under, women and men 19 and under. So this is basically what the coaches are looking for in terms of athletes and their minimum performances to be potentially a national or world class thrower at these ages. And these are obviously the, the 17 age is basically youth and the 19 age is junior. So you can kind of look at these performances. Here, um, let's see, make sure we got everything. And notice here they have like the flying 10 meter sprint right here. So they have all kinds of parameters here, you know, sprint from standing start, sprint flying, a bunch of different uh, lifting, and then some throwing parameters here up at the top, the top uh, five or six columns. This is uh, right here, this bench, have bench press and then bench pull that you can see here. Um, this machine right here, this is the bench pull. It's like the reverse bench press. You're laying down, facing down towards the ground on this bench and you pull the bar up to your chest. So it's basically the opposite of the bench. This is what the bench pull is. And then here's some more parameters for uh, young shot putters from the German system. And here again, you have a few more um, sprints and then you have a bunch of jumps, vertical jump then overhand and underhand shot throws as well. So this is what they're looking for. Now, I wanna start showing you some rate of force development exercise to give you some real life examples. So this is Adam Nelson doing an example of a rate of force development exercise. He's basically doing a stand throw here, but he's actually gonna be stand throwing out of the power position, an implement that's already moving. So I'll just play this and you can kind of watch it. So you can see he's, he's taking a kettlebell, he's pulling it with his non-throwing arm and then finishing off the throw with his throwing arm. And then he's working both the left and right side equally. So now he's working the right side and then he runs and then he does the left side. So he's throwing, working the left arm right there. So he's obviously working in a little bit of fitness here with this. Adam was done with his throwing workout here, and then he did this set of exercises after. Uh, you can see Ming Wong Chang, who's the Taiwanese record holder and Olympic finalist from 2012. He was in the background picking up a shot. He's starting his throwing session here. So you can see with Adam, and I'll, I'll play this through one more time. Instead of throwing the shot, or the, in this case, the kettlebell, which weighs about the same as a 16 pound shot. I think this is a 16 pound kettlebell. Instead of throwing it from a static position, he's getting the shot already moving a little bit and then he's, he's accelerating it. So it's almost like a throw from a fly. He's just, he's throwing an already moving object. So it's a little bit different type of acceleration. At the end of his career, Adam got a little bit better at these exercises. And this probably helped him maintain his 22 meter form a bit better rather than um, purely working on his vertical jump and his static lifts and those type of things. He did more dynamic timing based exercises better as he got older. So sometimes you know, they call this a version of old man strength and uh, not, not that Adam's too old here. He's probably 34, 35 years old here. Um, but Old man strength basically means you know how to apply your strength. You have lots of experience and you're better at applying your strength than a younger, more you know, unskilled person. So these rate of force development exercises, we probably plug them in two to three times a week 
uh, you know, maybe on a Monday, Wednesday, Friday, maybe do them on the non-throwing days, you know, on a non-technical shot throwing day. And, uh, or if we did them on a, a shot throwing day, we definitely do them after we threw technically. We wouldn't do them as a warm up beforehand. It gets you probably a little bit too tired to work on your technique really well. Now, running and speed development here. Um, this is just an example of running and speed development. This is just some stair sprints. Um, these are some of my favorite exercises for, uh, for throwers. On the left is Tom Walsh, obviously many time world champion. This is Denzel Comanenci right here. He's a 2088 shot porter, but he's also about a 77 meter hammer thrower. He's mainly focusing on hammer now, um, but he would train with Tom and you can see he's, he's as fast, if not faster than Tom, which is why Tom likes doing this stuff with him. And you can see both these guys weigh at least, uh, you know, Tom's about 135 kilograms, 134 kilograms. Denzel is about uh, 127 kilograms and they're pretty quick. You can see the foot speed going up the, the steps here. And if you look at rotational shot, it's pretty much one or one and a half steps. You know, it's just one step out of the back and then kind of like a half step as you turn around in the middle, but you need to have quick feet. I like running hills and steps because you get all the benefit driving up the steps, but yet you don't pound your knees and body so much coming down on the step because you have very little, um, uh, you know, motion to come down, all the motions are going up, they're not coming down. So it's very, it's easier on the body. Now for max velocity running, um, as I showed you on those charts there, we have the static like 20 meter sprint or 30 meter sprint. We also have the flying 20 meter sprint. We, um, if you look at this picture here, this is a Sheenie Miller from Jamaica doing a sprint. You can see the cones right here. This is where he, he started back on the field, got a running start. When he passed through the cones, we started the, the camera. And then when he breaks the beam right here, we finish the measurement. So and here's Nick Vina. Nick Vina is about a 2060 shot porter here. He's leaning in to try to finish here. Um, this basically what the flying 20 show you is they give you an idea of what your maximum velocity is. Your max acceleration is going to be out of a static start but the flying 20 shows what your top end speed is. And I do think top end speed's fairly important because it just kind of shows, um, it's kind of like understanding what your absolute strength is. You're not gonna be moving like that in an actual throw. You're not gonna be throwing at top speed. You can't, you're only taking one step inside the ring, but you like to know what your top end is because the higher, the faster you can run, the more room you have to be quick and accelerate, I believe. With that, that's kind of the thinking there. So. If you don't have these type of beams, if you're really good and quick with a stopwatch, you can anticipate, you can take some pretty accurate times just doing a flying 20 meters um, you, you know, with, with a stopwatch. Now, plyometrics and jumping. This is an example. This is Denzel Comanincha doing some one-legged plyometrics, some low-level plyometrics. You can see he's, he's not going very high. He's staying pretty low. These are six inch banana hurdles, about 15 centimeters tall. We're keeping him on the grass because you can see he's in his full shot put form right here. He's probably about 127, maybe even 128 kilograms. So we want to try to save the wear and tear on the body and stay on the grass. As you can see, he's very quick off the ground. We're trying to spend as little time on the ground with uh, these type of movements as possible. And obviously with the rotational technique, when you turn out of the back, you're going to be on one leg. When you land and turn in the middle, you're going to be on one leg. So doing and being competent at doing one-legged hops, changing direction, moving forward, whatever it may be, I believe is important. For, and this is an example of him doing a, a multiple one-legged hop on the right leg. You want to do this equally with the left leg as well. I'll show you one other type of exercise. It's kind of a fancy exercise here, but it shows you the different types of training you can do. This, this kind of falls under, uh, you know, plyometric uh, act activity. And this is Tom Walsh right here. And he's sort of doing a reverse jump squat. So what he's trying to do is, and I'll play the video for you. He ha he's, has a harness here around him with some uh, bungees attached to him. He's gonna work on absorbing force and then redirecting it back up into the throw. So I'll play this through a couple of times so you can see what he's doing. This is Coach Dale Stevenson helping him out with the exercise. So 
So what he's doing here, as you can see, the coach is taking him and he's throwing him down into the ground. So he's trying to push him down into the ground and Tom has to stop himself and then redirect himself upwards. Once he starts redirecting himself upwards, the bungees help him pull up. And this really works on the landing and reacting forced into the throw. You watch when he lands. He doesn't really let his heels drop. He stays in the balls of feet, doesn't let his heels drop. He reacts, stays up on the toes so he can jump right away. This is obviously a very specialized exercise where you need some fancy equipment here to do this. But I just want to show you an idea of designing different type of training programs and different type of exercises to facilitate the type of uh, physical work you need to do when you're throwing. So landing in the middle of the ring and then reacting up into the throw is very, very important. So this type of exercise has played a big role in Tom's success, being able to absorb force in the middle of the ring, then redirect it into the delivery. This is a device Tom uses. Uh, it, it's uh, called Gym Aware. And basically what it does is it, it shows you, it basically shows him three things. He lists the load that he has on his back, which is basically 50 kilograms right here. And then this is basically the amount of uh, power he's producing in Newtons. And this is the velocity of, uh, of the bar on his back once he gets it going at top speed again. So you can see with 50 kilograms, he's producing about 8,800 Newtons on average. And he's probably getting the bar moving about 2.7, 2.8 meters per second. In the weight room, that's fast. In real life, that's not that fast. So this is kind of over, over compensation training. Over here with 40 kilograms, a little bit lighter load, you can see he's producing a little bit more power around on average, probably about 9,000 Newtons at, at the point of jump. <clears throat> but look at the velocity that he's, that he's doing here. It's over three meters per second. So he's, it's obvious when you have a lighter weight on you, you can jump and move the bar faster. So I, I'm just showing you an example here. Theoretically, what he's trying to do is he's trying to move as fast as he can and jump off the ground as fast as he can with a weight on his back. And this uh, software is able to tell him exactly how fast he's moving and how much power he's producing. So let me show you some classical weight training, obviously. Uh, this is some classical weight training in terms of absolute strength. This is Denzel Comanentia lifting right here. This is a regular power clean. This is a max power clean. Um, this is 190 kilograms. Okay, so I'll play it here. Just one. So you can see when he's doing this lift here, he's moving the bar from here up to about there. He's only moving the bar probably 80, 90 centimeters tops. And the bar, because it's moving such a short uh, way, it's not moving very fast. It's probably moving one meter per second, maybe 0.9 meters per second, but he's moving a lot of weight. So he's generating a lot of power. Now, in order to prepare to be able to lift like this, he'll do a series of lifts. This is a set of three at 155 kilograms. Watch the bar is going to move a little bit faster here. Okay. And so you can see he's, he's incorporating a little bit of what Tom was doing with this, with this triple like this and that Denzel's Coming in, he's pulling and moving a weight, then stabilizing, then coming back down, stabilizing, pulling back up again, and reacting right away. So you can see when the bar comes down, he reacts right away with 155 kilograms in his hands. And he finishes off the lift right there. So this is a couple of examples of classical weightlifting involving absolute strength. This will probably make up, these type of exercises will probably make up about 25% of your whole weight training program uh, for, um, 
for shop putting. Now, this is a little bit, this isn't really absolute strength development. This is something that's probably borders the line between absolute strength um, and then rate of force development in terms of exercises. This is a speed clean and jerk. So he's doing two movements. And when you think about the rotational shot, it's kind of two movements as well. It's a turn out of the back of the ring to the power position and then a throw out of the power position. So when you look at the rhythm of this exercise here, this is like the turn out of the back and then he transitions right into the, the delivery. So we have one, two. And then watch his feet. This just, just look down at his shoes. He, he jumps up off the ground and when he lands, he starts jumping right again into that second extension. And he's doing this with about, you know, 60, 65 kilograms, something like that. And he's doing, he's doing one of these and then he rests, recovers, then does a single. So he's kind of treating this like a throw one at a time. Now to finish up here, I want to show you just to just talk really quickly about some of the exercises we talked about. Um, I've developed this data right here in terms of the correlation between vertical jump and uh, in, in throwing far for a rotational shot. This for the most part has involved data from a lot of the top shot putters in the world. You can see most of these shot putters in, in this particular study here are over 20 meters. There are a few from 17 to 19 as well. So you can see, and basically what you're looking at is, um, I plot all these numbers and what we have is, we have two data points. This is how far the athlete's thrown in meters and what their vertical jump is. And you can basically see what this tells you is, is the higher the vertical jump, the far they tend to throw. The correlation for that's 0.54. That's pretty good. It's not great. And yeah, just because you're a great jumper doesn't mean you're going to be a great thrower. Um, but there is a bit of a correlation there. And generally, it's positively correlated. If, you're, if your vertical jump gets better, most likely what you're going to see over time is the thrower is going to get be throwing further. Now, we do something like the back squat in the distance thrown. And you look here, and the numbers are all over the place. And you can see this line is flatter. Basically what this is showing is there isn't as much of a correlation between squats and throwing the shot real far. Now, some of the best shot porters uh, obviously have good squats, but if you look in this group here, look where the best squatters were, right in this area here, barely at 20 meters, 19 and a half meters. And you have some of the best squatters or the lowest squatters are right here in the 22 meter range. And they're barely squatting 170 or 155. Pretty incredible right there. Now you look at some of these athletes up here and go, what is going on up here? These guys have these massive squats, yet they're not up here at the top of the chart. What is going on up here? I can tell you anecdotally, these athletes are usually really, really good athletes, but they're from countries that don't have a good throwing tradition. So they don't really have a strong throws coach. So what they're doing is they're throwing and just lifting a lot. Lift, 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 and throw some. It's very easy to, if you lift a lot to see that you're getting stronger. So lifting is very enticing. But what you get is you get great weightlifting numbers like the squat, which is an easy exercise to learn how to do, but you don't get the great improvement in the distance. So the weight, the, I'm using this slide to kind of show you that weightlifting, especially squatting, can be a little bit detrimental sometimes. It, it's not, just because you squat a lot doesn't necessarily mean you're going to throw far. Now, you look at something like this. Again, this is the uh, same type of data here. Yeah, the correlation is 0.31. It's, it's pretty low. On the other hand, look at the correlation here. For this one, you can see all these marks are tight around the line. The correlation is 0.72. This is for the correlation between the power clean and distance for rotational shot putting. It's pretty good. So Olympic lifting, usually athletes that are pretty good at Olympic lifting, as they get better, they usually get better at throwing too. So Olympic lifting, like the cleans and the snatch, they're usually a pretty stable part of any type of weight training that I put together on my end. 
Here's the numbers for the snatch. Pretty similar, although you can see that the correlation is not quite as much. I know you may ask, what, why, why is that? Because I will say this, if I had to choose one exercise to do in the weight room, if you could do it, I'd do the snatch instead of the clean. It's a little bit more explosive and dynamic. I believe the reason for this number though is, is why it's not 0.72 is uh, shoulder flexibility. There, there's some good throwers out there. They're really good at the clean and throw far, but when they go do the snatch, they don't have the shoulder flexibility to catch the snatch. They don't do it quite as well. And so it makes the correlation go down, but that's not because it has what, anything to do with throwing. It has to do with shoulder flexibility and then catching the weight. Here again, these two guys way up here, I can tell you these two guys are national record holders for countries that don't have a big shot put tradition. But yet, you know, they're throwing, you know, 20 point high and 21 meters. But all they do is they lift, lift, lift. They didn't throw as much. They just lifted a lot. And whatever distance they did get was mainly due to the lifting. But they were strong enough, I felt, to be 22 and a half meter throwers if they had the technique and timing. And then here's the correlation for bench press and, and shot putting. And this is for men. It's pretty good. It's 0.61. Not quite as good as the Olympic lifts, but much better than the squat. And you can see these, these marks fit around the line a lot better. In fact, this correlation is pretty good. You could probably slide over here and go, well, your typical 19 meter shot putter benches around 180 kilograms. That, that's probably about right. You're not going to see that many 19 meter shot putters that lift a little bit, only bench 100 kilograms. You're not going to have a mark way down here. It's going to be at least up in here someplace, 150, 160 kilograms, if not, if not 170. Oops, I accidentally pressed that. That was the last slide anyway. Um, I somehow pressed it um, without really meaning to. But uh, it's 12.57 here. I kind of want to finish with that as far as the power training. I know it's kind of a very basic overall overview of power training. Uh, we could do a whole day-long seminar on the different aspects of it. And we could always continue this in the future too. But uh, any, any questions at all of anything I brought up so far with this little talk here? Um, oh, you have anything? Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I was just uh, looking through and me, thinking get, about the... Let me get you unmuted there. There you yeah. go. Uh, no, you're still yeah, muted. Yeah, I was... Oh. I'm still muted? Am I on? No, no, you're good. Yeah, you're good. All right, yeah. Um, I was thinking of in terms of the transferability of, of the lifts. And sometimes um, by, because an athlete is not, as you said, in the snatch, for example, um, is not as flexible. They may not uh, feel comfortable doing the snatch. Yes. Um, but I, I think I share the same view that the, the snatch, because it is a faster movement, um, has more transferability to either of the touring events, you know? Um, however, I don't use it a lot. I, I use it with the, with, the, with the athletes who are uh, more technically- um, Yeah, advanced, right? yeah. Um, I created, you remember the exercise that uh, was called in the, the NIDA press? Yeah, NIDA press, yeah, yep. Yeah, um, so I use that a bit and then I use much like a modified version of the um, a squat clean and press. Um, so you just use just a squat and press, which is just a kind of variation of the of a, a push jerk. Yes. And 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 that I see has has been able to to make things a little simpler. Yeah. But keep generating power. Um, in, in most of the athletes that I train. Yeah. Yeah, the, uh, no, those are all, all good adjustments, you know, with the, with a snatch too, if there's some shoulder flexibility issues, you can just do a snatch high pull as well. So you eliminate the catching uh, portion. And also yeah. for safety reasons too, you can have people that, um, you know, you're, you're worried about them not catching it well above their head and then maybe straining a shoulder. So. Uh, I know a lot of people um, adjust their, their snatch workouts to do a high pull 
if anything. Um, if you have dumbbells too, you can do a one arm snatch as well too. And that's actually a little bit more stable on the shoulder because when you catch it, you'll be holding it directly above the shoulder joints. Whereas yeah. with the traditional snatch, you're holding it out to the, you know, to the side and you get a shearing force on the joints. And I can tell you at my age now, I'm paying for that heavy overhead lifting, you know, from 30, yeah. 35 years ago. So um, it's, uh, so there's lots of different variations you can do there. The, um, the overhead stuff, like you said, there's, there's the jerk, the push jerk, the push press, the neater press. There's lots of different variations uh, that you can do and you can, you can mix and match them depending on where your athlete is in development and, and, uh, and what they're capable of doing too. And then what, and what they feel comfortable in doing. So it's good to have all these tools in your toolbox and just, you know, break them out accordingly. So. Yeah. I, I just wanted to ask something else other than yeah. that. Um, uh, as far as the periodization goes, uh, let's take a typical week. How would you go about programming the uh, strength and conditioning and the the throwing itself? So um, in different phases of the training. So let me. Uh, I'll give you. I'll give you my approach that I mainly use, for example, and I'll give you the theory why. Um, and, and it'll it'll be adjusted for individual athletes as well. But for example, we'd throw the shot maybe let's say an average of three times a week. And this would be for somebody that's going to school as well, like a school age person. So they, they'd have some other things to do, or maybe it's just somebody that's working as well and has to work full or part time. So you don't have lots of time to train, but you throw three times a week, let's say Monday, Wednesday, Friday. With the lifting, you could put the lifting on the alternate days like Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, or you could put the lifting even it, it, depending on your situation, you could put it on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday as well. But I'd put the lifting definitely after the throwing. I wouldn't put it before the throwing. So in terms of order, you do throwing first, you know, the fine skills first, and then the, um, the, the gross motor skills second, like the lifting. So uh, I would do it that way. With the lifting, I, I really think when you're throwing all that shot, you're learning how to manipulate your body and move. I don't really think you have to lift all that much in terms of like lifting for hours and hours. I think maybe one and a quarter to one and a half hours of steady lifting, you know, not messing around, but like focused, good, hard work with just, you know, not, not a lot of talking in between and that type of stuff, you know, an hour and 15 minutes up to an hour and a half, three times a week will be, be enough lifting right there. And within that lifting session, you probably do two of what we call the core lifts in each session. So let's say the first lifting session, if you're going to do three in one week, the first one would be um, like clean, for example, and then bench press afterward. Then you might do snatch and then like push press afterward in the second session. Then the third session you do squat and then maybe uh, some type of overhead press again, or maybe some light type of Olympic lift or maybe a, an incline press, incline bench press. That would probably take half your time right now. That'd take 45 minutes. Then the other 45 minutes would be on about four or five supplementary exercises. There might be bodybuilding exercises, might be twisting exercises, some type of machine lifts where you're working body parts that you might not have been working on in the other lifts. Um, these can also be medicine ball routines and those type of things. Then probably during the week too, I'd probably get in three to four type of running or jumping type of exercises, depending on what you have on your disposal. You might want to put those opposite the days that you're throwing. So if you're throwing Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you might run and jump, let's say Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, that'd be three times a week. And then maybe if you wanted, you could put in a little bit of running on Friday as well, maybe just to loosen up the legs after the squatting session, if, if you were to lift on, on uh, that day. So, uh, so right there, what I've described is three throwing sessions, three lifting sessions, and three to four running jumping sessions. And that would be like during the, um, you know, the uh, general preparation phase. So right there, you basically have about nine to 10 different sessions within a given day. The most you'd be training in one given day would be about two and a half hours, I would say, maybe three, 
depending if you have a large group, you know, if you're, if you're throwing with a large group, it's going to take a little bit longer. But uh, these sessions I'm describing here, any given day will last about an hour to three hours, depending on if you're doing one or two things that day. When you get into the um, specific preparation before, right before the season's going to start, um, you know, maybe, you know, you might want to take off. It just depends how things are going. I'd probably keep the number of sessions around nine or 10, something like that. But I might add in an extra throwing day and take out a running day and keep the lifting at three times. And then when you get into the season, reduce the lifting down to two times. You're not going to need all that supplementary lifting because you, you'll have done that in a lot of throwing for a long time leading into the season. But when you get into the season, probably just lifting two good sessions a week, throwing three times a week with maybe a competition worked in there too. So that'd be a fourth time. And then the running and jumping would any, be anywhere from two to four sessions a week, although not nearly as intense as what you were doing before, because you're going to have to incorporate some rest in there too. And then obviously as you get later in the competition season, you're probably throwing two times a week and competing, lifting two times a week, lighter, and then running two times a week. So you're building it, you're gradually building in more and more rest as the competition season goes on. So that, that would be the basic overview. And then having at least one full day off there. I had like Sunday, for example, be the off day. Um, but have at least one full day of rest somewhere in there. Yeah. Um, I think that's a pretty good, a pretty good overview there. Um, and much like what I do in terms of uh, how, how we train, um, in terms of the programming, that's kind of like that. Yeah. I'll, um, uh, if you'd like in, in the, when I set that Dropbox, um, I, I might put some workouts in there. I'll give you like Denzel's workouts um, when he was doing shot. And uh, I'll just give you some samples for different times of the year and you can just kind of take a look. And uh, yeah. it, it'll be what I just described, but it'll be all written down for you. So you won't have to remember what I said. You can always go back and listen to the uh, the video though too. So, okay. All right. I know you say you got some other things to be doing. So, yeah, I got I got to run to practice here. We got jab and practice in just a little bit. So, uh, um, but uh, ho hopefully this was helpful to you. I hope uh, it helps the young coaches out there as well. And, and and I like this to serve as a reference if need be. You know, just to have something like this. And like I said, I'll put it in Dropbox for you. And uh, and then I'll let you know, I'll shoot you an email and let you know about that uh, with the Dropbox. And okay. the, I can tell you with the IFAC conference that's in England, if they told me if you want to get a hold of the NACAC office and Richie Mercado in the NACAC office, and I'll just see if I can get you his direct email. I don't know if you know Richie, if you dealt with him some. Yeah, the I interacted with Richie in um, Chula Vista in 13. Okay. Um, uh -huh. He, they, if, if you want to look at getting a potential, uh, potentially scholarships for that conference, he's the person to talk to, go through the NACAC office of what they told me. The, the uh -huh. BC one, I'm going to talk to them directly. It's, it's at about the same time, but I think it's later in the day. It also spills over into the week. So, um, so that one won't conflict as much. I'll just see if I can get you straight in on that one. I'll let you know in the next three or four days with that. And yeah, that's the one with, with uh, Boris uh, Henry, you know, Vetter's coach. We'll be yeah, speaking. Yeah. And then uh, Ashley Kovach, Joe Kovach, his wife and coach, and Ryan Whiting is coaching most of the top American uh, throwers now in the shot. And then I'll, I'll be speaking there too.